Hello, uh, my name is Mohan Sani and uh, I'm a professor at Northwestern's Kellogg School of Management. I'm delighted to be able to join you virtually for uh, Connect 2021. Uh, I wish I could be there in person, but uh, in this world that we live in uh, with travel and with COVID, um, the next best thing to, is to be able to join you virtually. So I was asked to reflect on deep tech and building deep tech startups into unicorns. What's different? What's same? What are the mindsets and principles that we should bring to the understanding of the deep tech landscape and what it takes to build, grow, and sustain a deep technology venture? So I'm going to organize my remarks around a few themes. First, I'm going to reflect on the waves of entrepreneurial innovation that has taken place in India and what the past has been about and what the future might be. Then we're going to talk a little bit about what do we mean by deep tech? Let's get some calibration, let's get some definition around this concept of deep tech. What are the characteristics of deep tech companies or startup ventures? And how do they look different from traditional uh, technology startup companies that we see today? What are the different domains within which deep tech companies can be created? There are a variety of scientific and technology domains. So we'll look at these domains and what are some of the themes uh, of convergence that we see that are creating new opportunities for deep tech. Then we'll focus on the challenges of deep tech companies. They face some very different and unique challenges in terms of defining the market, in terms of uh, creating the right solution, in terms of uh, funding and skill sets and the ecosystem that needs to be created in order for deep tech companies to prosper. And then we will look a little bit more closely at the deep tech ecosystem in India. It's still nascent, it's still emerging, uh, but why this might be a good time uh, for us to start focusing both investors, the government and uh, entrepreneurs to be start focusing on these domains and what the future might hold. So let's look at the past. Where were we and where we have come? Now, as you all know, the entrepreneurial activity in India got started off with IT services companies. Right? This was the emergence of body shopping where we had companies that started to build software applications by shipping people um, you know, to the US and uh, working on software development uh, using the global delivery model eventually. And these were, of course, the big Indian majors today, the Wipros and the Infosys and the TCS and the Cognizance and the, uh, you know, the, the, these firms. So that was sort of the first wave of entrepreneurial activity, focusing on services, focusing on global customers. Then around the, about 15 years ago, you know, in the early to mid 2000s, we started to see the emergence of a next category of companies, of entrepreneurial ventures, and these were largely e-commerce companies. And these e-commerce companies took the business models that were well established in the United States that were uh, successful, the, you know, the Amazons and the E-Trades and the Ebays of the world, and they tried to replicate that for the Indian context. Now, what was interesting about these, these, these entities were that they, for the first time, really focused on the Indian customer and the Indian consumer. And uh, as opposed to the first wave of uh, the IT services startups that are really focused on the global market, they really were not looking at the domestic market. So we saw a lot of activity and of course, came out, out of that came Flipkart and Paytm and Amazon India and a variety of other companies in, 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 in a wide range of uh, e-commerce spaces in financial services, in, uh, in e-learning and, and, and so on. 
And of course, some, we have seen some major recent successes in the e-learning space, whether it's a Baiju or Eruditis and, uh, or, or, or Upgrad or Simply Learning, um, or whether it is you know, financial services companies, and we have started to see them now finally access the public markets also, as opposed to only relying on uh, uh, capital providers like Tiger Global and uh, SoftBank. So that was e-commerce. That's pretty mature now. And, uh, and even e-commerce is now evolving into sort of a more nuanced phase where we're starting to look at B2B uh, e-commerce and we're trying to look, we are also starting to now build software companies, enterprise software companies, people who are building cloud-based enterprise applications. So there's a shift from B2B to B2C, I mean B2C to B2B, and there's also kind of a shift from e-commerce to sort of building SaaS or cloud-enabled software products and services. So that's where we've come. But now going forward, there is a new class of startup ventures. There's a new class of entrepreneurial ventures that are starting to bubble up, that we're starting to see. By the way, not only in India, but of course across, across the world. And this is what we call deep tech or deep technology. All right, let me, let me take an example. An example is uh, if you look at how COVID-19 uh, vaccines were developed and the messenger RNA technology that was used to develop these vaccines, one of the most successful startups of all time, in fact, is uh, BioNTech. And BioNTech was a, a startup company that actually started out of the University of Mines in 2008 to do cancer research and went through lots of fits and starts and, um, and, and, and almost went out of business until they received some funding from Pfizer and the government. And ultimately they redirected their research to uh, create the Moderna vaccine, uh, 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 sorry, the, the, the COVID-19 vaccine. Now this company, as well as by the way, the other deep tech startup Moderna, which also created a messenger RNA vaccine, it has taken a long time. These, these companies have been in business a long time and we don't see that. We don't see the long gestation period. We just see the the overnight success, right? The overnight success that took two decades to build. So clearly we've seen some phenomenal successes of late in medicine and in, in artificial intelligence and lots of other spaces, but deep tech very often is the culmination of a very, very long journey. So what is deep tech? It actually is firms or ventures that really rely on fundamental advances in technology, and they do groundbreaking scientific research in order to solve complex problems. So deep tech ventures are defined by their visionary ambition, their focus on fundamental research, but at the same time, some pragmatism around commercial applications. So as opposed to applying the technologies that exist, deep tech companies actually come up with technological advances. They build new foundational technologies that have potential to actually create entirely new industries or entirely new markets. They deal with technology and engineering challenges that are fundamental, that are deeper, that take longer to solve. And that is why we call it deep tech. Deep refers to the idea that it's fundamental research, but deep also refers to the idea that, the, that it takes a long time for these technologies to actually find uh, their application markets and uh, you know, find useful application. So deep tech companies usually focus on technological advances or novel technologies uh, that offer significant advances over what already currently exists. Uh, but it may take a long time for it to fructify. So this, so it's not product to market, it's actually lab to market, or it's sort of a intellectual property idea and uh, to market. So there's, even before we talk about R&D, there is fundamental research. And, and that is why in many cases, deep tech innovations come out of universities, come out of academic institution, come out of government laboratories. You know, projects like DARPA, the Defense Agency, uh, in the United States that led to the creation of the internet. Uh, so the genesis of deep tech technologies is, or, or is different. They come from different sources and they take much longer. So, in, so let me make a very interesting distinction between sort of fundamental research and knowledge advancements and deep tech. 
Uh, there was a fascinating model called the Pasteur model that was uh, created in 1997 uh, to describe uh, technology innovations or ventures on two dimensions. One dimension is, is it fundamental advance in, 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 in human knowledge or not? And the second dimension is, is there a need or a focus on commercial application or use cases or not? So there is a quadrant called the Bohr quadrant named after Niels Bohr. And that quadrant is where it is a fundamental advance and there is really no attention given to the use case. Theoretical physics, you know, particle physics, quantum, uh, quantum mechanics, those are examples of that quadrant. But then there is the Edison quadrant, which is, it's not a fundamental advance, it's more sort of a, an application of technologies that exist, and there is a very strong focus on the use case. So that's Thomas Edison, who was famous not for inventing stuff, but for applying stuff and making it actually commercially viable. But then there is that interesting quadrant of fundamental research, but a focus on application, a focus on the problem, a focus on the use case. That is what we call the Pasteur quadrant, after Louis Pasteur, who you know used fundamental research, but used it to come up with some very practical application like pasteurization, right? So that is really what deep tech is about. While the advances are fundamental, the, 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 the approach has to be pragmatic, the approach has to be focused on use cases. So let's look at sort of the characteristics of these deep tech companies. There are a few things that, that come to mind. First of all, deep tech ventures should be problem oriented, right? So they focus on the large and fundamental challenges that our society faces, whether it is in agriculture or climate change or education or healthcare or fundamental advances in material technologies that will make kind of the world a better place. So that's the first thing that a deep tech uh, venture should be focused on a problem and a deep and fundamental problem. The second thing is that they need to look at technologies that are not yet mature, technologies that are nascent, that technologies that are emerging, scientific advances that are fundamental, uh, and it's not derivative, it's not incremental, it's not sustaining, it's usually a disruptive technology. So this might be advanced materials, this might be synthetic biology, this might be artificial intelligence, this might be quantum computing. So, and, and what is also interesting is that many deep technology ventures actually use a combination of these technologies, more than one advanced technology. It's a convergence of technologies in order to create their, their ventures. Another very interesting characteristic is that traditional, but like the early stages of deep, deep technology ventures really focuses mo focus mostly on digital innovation. So today, if you look at the deep tech landscape, you know, there's a lot of uh, emphasis on artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning uh, based uh, deep tech companies. But, you know, going forward, it will not only be innovation based on bits, but it will also be innovation based on atoms. So a combination of bits and atoms, right? So for example, so they may be building a physical product. Look at vaccine research or synthetic biology, for instance. In fact, synthetic biology is the area where most of the investments have, uh, the largest investments in deep tech have gone, followed by artificial intelligence, right? And, uh, and the final interesting characteristic is that deep tech often relies on cross-organizational collaboration, you know, different forms of entities, research labs coming together with universities, coming together with the government, coming together with venture capitalists, coming together with entrepreneurs. Uh, so it's a very complex and cross-organizational ecosystem that you need because there is basic research that needs to be done. Uh, fundamental research needs to be supported and the funding models uh, for supporting this kind of research are quite different, right? So there's a complexity and a cross-disciplinary nature of the ecosystem. Now, let's talk about domains and why this is becoming, why do we see sort of a inflection point in the creation of these deep learning technologies and ventures? So if you look at the convergence of three important domains, matter and energy, sensors and motion, and computing and cognition. At the intersection of these domains arise a lot of interesting deep technology ventures. So what do we mean by matter and energy? 
So, right? so matter and energy include sort of materials, nanotechnology, energy technologies, synthetic biology. Right? And then on the senses, sensing and motion, it might mean sensors, it might mean artificial uh, uh, AR, augmented reality, virtual reality, drones, and so on. And in computing and cognition, we talk about you know, processing, artificial intelligence, cloud technologies, quantum computing. So the intersection of these domains, you find interesting domains like bioprinting, biofoundries, self-driving aut autonomous vehicles, uh, in silico drug development, and, and, and so on. So what is happening is that these domains uh, powerful new technologies are emerging, right? Artificial intelligence, uh, nanotechnology, next generation UX design, blockchain, robotics, universal printing. And in addition, the computing platforms continue to progress with Moore's law, right? So the data volume, artificial intelligence algorithms and their capacity, the cost of DNA sequencing, the cost of quantum computing, the cost of solar energy and renewable energy sources, all of these are exponentially declining. So on the one hand, technologies are emerging faster. On the other hand, the costs are declining exponentially. And this allows you to create innovative new solutions at cost points that were not possible before, right? So that is basically the reason that we see these particular, um, the, the deep tech te technology start to come up with in, in terms of their critical mass. Now, let us now focus on the challenges that deep tech companies face. First of all, deep tech type companies tend to be technology first. They always start with the technological breakthrough, right? That's the fundamental difference between deep tech and say an Uber or you know an Ola or any of these, Airbnb. So these companies start with a customer problem and work their way backwards to come up with a technology solution. So it's a problem first approach that conventional startups take. But deep tech companies take a technology first focus, right? So they come up with a technological breakthrough. So they, there's a novel technology, there's some intellectual property, just some PhD research or thesis work. And then you have to find real world problems you can solve. Let me give you an example of my own brother, Dr. Amar Sahani, who is a medical devices entrepreneur and he has founded you know, over 15 companies. He did his PhD thesis work in the University of Texas at Austin on biomaterials. So specifically creating cross-linked polymers that allow you to modify the surface tension between any two, proper, two, two surfaces. So that was his thesis work. It was a technology. Now where, where could you apply this? So the first application that he found or he used was for OBGYN. Uh, for preventing post-operational adhesion and fibroid formation when women go through a C-section. But the same technology could be allowed to, was, was used by him later to create a product called Duraseal. And that Duraseal was a product that was created for sealing the, 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 the Dura uh, after a brain surgery. So when you put sutures on the brain, it's not uh, on the Dura, it's not watertight. So this was a sealant that he created. He has since used that technology for uh, uh, a whole variety of applications on different organs and has founded you know, more than a dozen companies. So the idea here is that you come up with a novel technology, a fundamental technology, and then you have to find the use cases and the applications for it. Consider a mate another material technology, Kevlar. Kevlar was created by DuPont many years ago. It was a strong light material, one third the weight of steel, but much stronger. So Kevlar continues to find new use cases, right? Of course, it went into bulletproof jackets, it went into steel belted radial, replacement of steel belted radial tires, but now there are interesting new applications uh, that, that they continue to find, such as bulletproofing of cars in the aftermarket in Brazil, using Kevlar sheets to wrap bridge pillars to prevent the deterioration of bridges, kind of band-aid for a bridge, and so on. So the challenge with the deep tech companies is that if you're not careful, you have a, we have something called the CISP problem, solution in search of a problem, right? 
because you come up with the, the solution, you come up with the technology, but finding the use case, finding the application, finding the end use markets is very challenging. Now, if you had started in reverse, when you started with a customer problem, you know that there's a customer, you know there's a use case because that's where you began with. Uber started with the problem that it is a pain in, to get a taxi, the taxi experience is horrible. But when you come up with a fundamental material, a fundamental medical device, a fundamental technological breakthrough, there is no assurance that you're going to find a customer or a viable use case for it. So that's the first challenge for a deep tech company. So the other challenge is that the market doesn't exist. In many cases, you actually have to create entirely new markets. So there's a lot of education involved. Customers need to be educated about these markets and you need to really figure out how you're going to actually create this entire new new way of thinking. There was, I remember a company I worked with 25 years ago. It was called Illinois Superconductor. So they had created a superconducting filter that would be used in cellular base station. And it was significantly more efficient than the existing conventional filters and it would allow you to increase the size of the, uh, the range of a cell tower as, as well as to improve the call quality. However, using superconducting filters that were really needed to be cooled with liquid nitrogen down to a very, very low temperature required the creation of an entirely new business, entirely new uh, model. Similarly, think about quantum computing. Think about you know fundamental advances in materials uh, using nanotechnology. You need to educate the market and startup ventures are very, very uh, bad or are not adequately resourced for market education. That's why sometimes deep tech comes out of big companies or big companies will like IBM or you know, AT&T and others can, can, can actually buy up these ventures and may need to because of the support that's needed. And by the way, related to that is the fact that funding is very difficult. The gestation period for deep tech companies is very long. It might take 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, because as I like to say, you can't put invention on a schedule. It is not easy to sort of come up with a deep tech venture that you're going to monetize within a, a few years. Typically, the, the gestation period for a deep tech company can be eight to 12 years as opposed to three to five years before you actually start to see revenues. So what that mean, means is you need patient capital. You need a lot of patient capital. You need you know, investors who have the long time horizon and conventional venture firms are not necessarily interested or are you know they want to see returns much faster. So you need a new class of investors who really have that patience, who are able to think ahead, who are able to wait and who are giving. So in fact, deep tech companies may need smaller infusions of capital, but over a longer period of time. And the final challenge is something that I alluded to earlier, that the ecosystem is different. The ecosystem is that, that the deep tech requires the support of a completely reimagined investment chain, participation from the government, participation from private equity firms, private uh, investments from corporate R&D and corporate business development, uh, as well as you know, uh, research labs. So the ecosystem, and this ecosystem, by the way, requires a very tight interplay between educational and research institutions and private industry. Because very commonly, deep tech innovations and startups may be created by university professors and academic researchers. So that integration between industry and academia and, and, and creating sort of incubators that can take and commercialize these ventures or these innovations is very, very important. So focus is difficult, the market is difficult, you know, finding the solutions is difficult, funding challenges are, are, are different and the ecosystem required is different. So now let's turn to the, the, the opportunities and let's look at sort of where India stands. I think India, has a unique set of advantages as an economy as we, we look at deep tech. India is a hub for talent, scientific and engineering talent. You know, we produce a quarter of the, 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 the world's engineers and we produce a lot of PhDs and scientists. So, Deep tech, the raw material that deep tech requires is scientific and engineering talent. So India has that, India has that vantage point. Right? 
We also have some really good research institutions, right? The Indian Institute of Technology, where I come from, Indian Institute of Science, DRDO, which is working on defense technology and so on. So, so there are some of these clusters that can be created around uh, these research institutions. So we've got that. We also have some very rich target problem domains, healthcare, education, high value manufacturing, Right? So there are these very, very large and complex problems, agriculture, that there are potential uh, applications that can sustain these deep tech startups. So the domestic market itself is quite massive. So there are a, uh, a lot of reasons for talent reasons, infrastructure being in place, the, and the problem domains being very rich that I think India and Indian entrepreneurs have a uh, you know, a good vantage point and a competitive advantage as they think about uh, deep tech. So the positioning is there, the ingredients are in place. However, a few things need to change. You know, a few things need to change. We need to, uh, you know, come up with a new generation of venture capitalists. Right? And these venture capitalists, uh, as I said, are people who are really not just changing the latest fad, but have the patience to think through and wait for the next generation technologies uh, to find their, you know, uh, their, their day in the sun. So there are some specialist venture funds that are starting to emerge around this. And a good example of this, for instance, is the Bharat Innovation Fund. And the Bharat Innovation Fund has made investments in some very interesting uh, deep tech startup. Uh, for example, uh, a startup that is focused on mapping brain waves to decipher emotional responses you know, which is entropic tech. There is a startup that is focused on condition monitoring for hard to reach assets. Um, there is Credit Vidya, which is an AI based automation platform that uses very, um, you know, different signals and machine learning for loan underwriting. There is a VPhrase, which is an AI based uh, natural language platform to provide business insights through automated reporting. Uh, there is an AR enabled Steam a uh, digital games platform called Play Shifu for young children. Uh, there is also a, a company called Fire Campus that they've invested in, which is an autonomous recon and attack platform that identifies pot possible attack vectors uh, through an automated red teaming platform you know, for military applications. So we're starting to see these emergence of these focused ventures, but also focused investors. But this is not enough the government also needs to shift its focus and create you know, funds that will support the development of these. Think about what DARPA has been able to do in the United States. Think about what NIH has been able to do, the National Science Foundation has been able to do. These are organizations that fund fundamental research, that give grants, that don't have investments in the traditional sense. They're able to give debt capital, they're able to give grant capital. So we need that level of funding to come from the government to be able to support these uh, uh, organizations. Another thing that really needs to happen is that fundamental research needs to be encouraged more at Indian universities and colleges. You know, until recently, you know, fundamental research has been lagging outside of a few institutions because they have focused much more on the mundane, on the application, because there hasn't been a demand for fundamental research, but that has to change. We need to change the promotion system, the tenure system, the evaluation system, so that faculty are incentivized to focus on fundamental research, to do deep research, uh, we need to build the Stanfords uh, of the world. We need to build the Carnegie Mellons of the world. We need to think about how we create these institutions that are focused on uh, fundamental research. And uh, one initiative that the government has started is the National Institutes of Eminence, right? The NIE. And those would be examples of initiatives that we, where we start to reward and recognize fundamental research so that you're not just chasing a fast buck. Right. So I do think that the future is bright. I do think that we are ushering in and entering a new era where you will have fundamental technological innovations created in India for the whole world. I think some of the ingredients are in place, but through the leadership of organizations like CII and NASCOM, 
as well as the active participation of some enlightened government organizations and, and bureaucrats, we can make India into a deep tech hub to envy. And this is not a project for the next year or the next two years. This is a project for the next 10 years, the next 20 years. And I hope that 10 years from now, we can point to unicorns that only didn't just do e-commerce or e-learning, but created fundamental breakthroughs in science and in technology to benefit the world at large, to solve some of mankind's toughest and most challenging problems. So I hope that you found these perspectives on what deep learning tech, deep tech companies are, what are the challenges that they face, what are the characteristics, and what the, the Indian deep tech ecosystem currently looks like and the opportunities. I hope you found this conversation and this discussion to be useful. I wish you all the best for the uh, CII Connect uh, conference. And I hope to see you in person soon in India for a future event hosted by the CIA. Again, thank you for giving me this opportunity and stay safe and be well.